walking in the Garden of Eden, communing with Adam and Eve, and there was kind of close fellowship, you know. It was literally down there with them. But sin, the Bible said, separates us from, from the God who loves us. Yeah. Since then, God devised ways and means uh, so that he could kind of dwell with us. So he devised a system, a complex system. Uh, I would say a really complex one, you know, uh, whereby he could not only metaphorically or symbolically, but in the real sense of the word, dwell with his people Israel in the Old Testament times. And so the first thing he did was to command Moses and the nation of Israel to, that was read by Helena a while ago, God said, make me a sanctuary. The King James and the New King James said, let them make me a sanctuary. The other translations would actually have it in a more current English idiom where they would say something like, have them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell, I may dwell among them. So it's always been God's desire to be with his people, to dwell with his people. And so in the sanctuary, if you remember the sanctuary system, it's worthwhile studying the Old Testament, actually. You know. In the Old Testament, there was this, uh, any of you here were Roman Catholics before? Okay. Roman Catholic Church, oh, I was, I was an altar boy, you know, till I graduated high school. Anyway, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, there's this enclosure, the outside is called the patio, or how do you say that in English? Patio. The court. Patio. Well, patio in Spanish, Espanol, uh, in Filipino we call it patio. And then uh, the courtyard. And then outside, there's the lapers where you dip in your fingers. With, did you notice that already it's an attempt to copy the Old Testament sanctuary building? Yeah. And then when you enter the, the, the building, the, the church is divided into two main sections. The bigger section is called, in those days when I was uh, a Saint Christian, when I was an altar boy, they call it uh, the, the Sanctor, the holy place. And then this area, I can surprise you also look like that one. This area in the Old Testament was called Sancto Sanctor, you know, I mean, the, the most holy place or the holiest the place. And inside the holy, between the holy place and the most holy place, there is this veil. The daily services were held down here in the holy place. But once a year, just once a year, there was this special service, the Yom Kippur. Oh yeah, by the way, October 5, was a Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement for the Jews. I was surprised, I saw that in my, in my tablet. It was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, wherein all the previous years, uh, sins, etc., were removed. The sanctuary was kind of cleansed. <clears throat> so, in that most holy place, God also commanded that a what do you call this? Uh, a small box. What do you call that in Filipino? Uh, in English they call it ark, but it's not Noah's ark. What do you call it? It's it's the ark of the covenant. It's a small wooden box, about 18 by uh, 12 by 6 uh, cubits, something like that. <laughs> and on top of that was a special um, object. It was made of pure gold. <coughs> it was called, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, it was called the, the kaporet. Okay? And in the, on top of the kaporet, together with the kaporet, were these two cherubim, okay? angels, okay? <coughs> with four wings, cherubim. And between the two cherubim, whose wings were <coughs> spread, between the two cherubim, there was this so-called Shekinah, or Shekinah, the presence, 
God's holy presence between the cherubim. So, the Israelites were conscious of God's presence in their midst through this system. Every day, you know, there was this service for sin offerings and all kinds of offerings. But this once a year thing is done only by the priest. And so by the time of uh, the kingdom, like King David and the other kings, they addressed God this way. I quote some of these. This is an invocation, a prayer song from Asa, the, you know, the musician. Psalm 80, maybe I should read it. Psalm 80. This is so beautiful. The Psalms, did you know that the book of Psalms was the so-called hymn book? It was the hymn book of the people of God in those days. It's the something like the SDA hymn book. So I'm reading Psalm number 80. That's why they say number, I said number 80. I didn't say chapter 80. It's a hymn book. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Who do you think he's addressing? God. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph like a flock, who you dwell, uh, you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth. So there's this consciousness among the people of God that God is there between the cherubim, inside the sanctuary. There's this consciousness that God is really dwelling with his people. There's this desire on the part of God so re to, to really dwell with his uh, people. In Psalm 99, verse 1, again, I just would like you to have an idea that, you know, of the perception of God's people in those days. Psalm number 99, beginning with verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. Peoples as in the nations. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. So God is, you know, God really would like to show his people that he desires to dwell with them, even in the earthly sanctuary. And uh, in Isaiah 36, 37, this will be the last one in this uh, thing. Isaiah 37. Verse, uh, verse 16, 37, 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, say, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Amen. So what I'm trying to point out to you is <clears throat> the people of God, even in the Old Testament, had a consciousness of God dwelling in His holy temple between the cherubim. Okay? So God dwells with His people in the cherubim. So that's the first thing that He did. He had a sanctuary built as a symbol of his presence. Between the cherubim, there's nothing that you see, okay? Because it is, and it was, and it is still forbidden for those who believe in God to make any help, graven image. That's why between the cherubim, from the point of view of human eyes, it was an empty space. 
but for the Jews, they see that as a Shekinah, as the presence of God, the Shekinah of glory. And then also, after that, God decided that there would be people who would run the religious system in the sanctuary. So he delegated and he appointed priests and helpers, Levites. Okay. So the priests and the Levites, they were all coming from the tribe of Levi. Okay. The priests from the family of Aaron and the other assistants, the Levites, okay, were coming from the non-Aaronic family. But all of them were Levites, and they served in the temple. They did all the services, all the offerings, etc. And the third thing that God did was to support this system that he established. Because the priests and the Levites were full-time. Remember that? They were full-time religious workers. They did not, you know, even the Levites, okay, the, the support staff, they were forbidden from gaining another kind of employment. And so it was their job to run the business, business the, the religious system established by God. Okay. And so they decided that they were going to work together for the interest of the nation of Israel and as God commanded. The third is that God did in this particular situation is to establish a support system for the running of the temple, for the running of the sanctuary. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers 18. See, this is my problem. I always preach from the Bible, not from what I think. Beginning with verse 8. <coughs> yeah. Verse 1, I should back up a little bit. You and your sons, speaking to Aaron, you and your sons, your father's house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary, and you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. So they were consecrated. Uh, actually, in Leviticus chapter 8, there was a special ceremony for them where they were consecrated and dedicated as priests. And in here, the Levites are also consecrated. Let's begin with um, uh, verse 8. This is now the support system that God decided for the priests to have. Beginning with verse 8. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, <clears throat> Here, God says, I myself have also given you charge of my heap offerings. Heap offerings are the ones that they raise and wave and present to the Lord as wave offerings. Now, God tells Aaron, I have given them to you. Okay? They are mine. The people of Israel present them to me, and I have given them to you. I have given them as a portion to you and to your sons as an ordinance forever. This shall be yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Uh, you remember there are other offerings like uh, burnt offerings and that kind of stuff, sin offerings. <clears throat> every grain offering, every sin offering, every trespass offering which they rendered to me 
shall be most holy for you and your sons. In the most holy place you shall eat it, every male shall eat it, it shall be holy to you. So this is one portion of God's support system for the priests. 11. This is also yours. The heap offering of their gift with all wave offerings of the children of Israel, I have given them to you, your sons and daughters with you, as an ordinance forever. Meaning, for the whole family of the priests. Yeah. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Yes. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were also ceremonial uncleanness. Let's say, for example, a person touches a dead body or a dead carcass, they'll be unclean. Or, sorry for these women, okay? Say, a woman, a women in their menstrual period, they were considered like, you know, ceremonially unclean, so they would not be, in this particular case, they'll be considered unclean for the particular time. That's what that last line means. And then verse 11, 12, I should say, all the best, wow, priests were pampered. All the best of the oil, this would be the, how do you say it for the oil? The first cold press, the virgin, you know, the virgin, the extra virgin, okay? So God now says, the best of the oil, or the best of the new wine. This is the unfermented wine. Which they offer to the Lord. I have given them to you. Whatever first ripe fruit is in their land, like, uh, give me some fruits. Apples, avocados, and papayas. I have given them to you as well. Whatever first ripe fruit is in their land which they bring to the Lord will be yours, shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Everything that first opens the womb of all flesh which they bring to me or to the Lord whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man, you shall surely redeem. That's another thing, I don't want to go there for now. And the firstborn of unclean animals, you shall also redeem, you shall also buy back, because, you know, they're not good for eating, and they're not good for, uh, what do you call this, uh, offerings in the sanctuary. So you have to buy them back. That's what redeem means. That's what redemption. Redemption in the Old Testament name. And those redeemed of all devoted things you shall redeem when one month old, according to your valuation. For five shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. All of this redemption money, buying back money, shall go to the priests as well. So in those days, the priests were really kind of pampered men. Today, maybe they would be driving like, uh, uh, what, what is this that I see in your garage? The end Yeah, the end of At least this is what God decided in the Old Testament. Leviticus 27. Leviticus 27, 32. Let me back up a little bit. 30. All the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land, seed as in grains, or of the fruit of the tree, whose is it? 
is the Lord's. What God is saying is, it's mine. It is holy to the Lord. 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, this gives us a kind of picture as to how they decided the tithe. Okay? The flock would be allowed to enter, you know, and the owner would be counting them with his stuff. Every tenth of it, whether big or small or healthy or not, the tenth is the tithe. You cannot change it. If you attempt to change it with something else, both the tithe and the one that you decided you would change for it, the two of them will become the Lord's. And this is in the Old Testament. <clears throat> he shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. If he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed, meaning you cannot buy it back. This is the reason why in Malachi, God accuses Israel. Will a mortal human being rob God? The, it's a rhetorical question. The expected answer is, no, no way. <clears throat> no human being would dare rob God. And then God says, and yet, and yet, you are robbing me in tithes and offerings. Let's go back to the tithes. Numbers 18. For the tithes of the children of it, 20, 24. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heap offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance, because I have given them. So the Lord claims the tithes for the Levites, the best of <laughs> best of everything, <coughs> fruit, grain, oil, etc., to the priests. And then also in Exodus chapter 13, God says, the firstborn, anything that opens the womb. You know, when, when, when a woman is pregnant and going to give birth for the first time, the womb is kind of closed, metaphorically, okay? And the firstborn is the one that literally opens the womb, okay? And God now says, every male uh, child or son, is holy to the Lord, is mine. And every animal that opens the womb is mine. Okay. So the Lord has mine, mine, mine. In the Philippines, you know, um, there are a lot of vendors uh, on, on Facebook. If you would like to buy something from them, say they're showing you an orchid, that kind of stuff, you just uh, shout it out first, mine then you'll be the, it's something like a bidding, mm -hmm. then you'll be the first one, you'll be the person who would, would buy that. And so, God now says, the firstborn is mine. Mm -hmm. For the clean animals, they should not be redeemed. Meaning, if, for example, your firstborn is a cow, you cannot buy it back. You have to give it to the temple. If the animal is unclean, unfit, for offering unclean for you know table for the table you have to buy it back say like for example a horse if you've got a horse that's a firstborn you have to buy it back 
because it is not acceptable to the temple. And where does the money go? To the priests and Levites. How about for the eldest son, for the firstborn son? You have to redeem the firstborn son because no human being is to be killed and offered in the sanctuary and no human being is to be eaten. So it's mandatory that you buy it back and there's a price according to age. Ladies, don't be sad with this. If the firstborn is a, as a girl, God does not claim it for the sanctuary. It's for the firstborn males. Because there's a rationale for that. There's a reason for that. Because according to the Lord, when he was trying to bring Israel out of Egypt, and the Pharaoh would not let his people go, God warned him, if you're not going to let my people go, I will kill your firstborn son. And not only the firstborn son, but also of the cattle, of the animals. And God did that, because Pharaoh would not let them go. So this is in something like uh, a in memoriam of what God had done. And so because of this, God now says, I spared your firstborns, therefore you have to redeem them. Kind of, you have to pay. And the money will go to the sanctuary for the service of the sanctuary. But then, of course, come our age. As a church, we decided to adopt as a church. Let me say the word. The principle of tithe giving and the principle of offering. We are not, we did not decide to follow like uh, the first fruits or the first grain or the best oil or the kind. But the principle of returning our tithes to the Lord because the Lord claims the tithe for himself and he is also asking us, you know what these hip offerings are? They are free will offerings out of the heart of this. But then we come to the New Testament. We're still in the so-called dwelling place of God. I would like to, in this particular section, I'd like you to listen carefully to the two passages in 1 Corinthians. Because all of us, including myself, grew up with the King James Version and the New King James Version. So, I'm reading 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 7. <laughs> Open your Bibles. Anybody here using New King James or King James? Let me see your hands, please. Oh, quite a lot. How about those who are not using King James? Okay. Open your Bibles with me. Okay. Those who are not using King James. Oh, also those who are using King James. 1 Corinthians 3. 16 and 17. Would somebody read that from your Bible, from your non King James Bible? Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Did he not destroy the temple of God? God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. That is what you are. Anybody here has? A new international version. Every street. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Amen. The same. Most of the there's a new one, the new version. Do you know that you are the temple of God 
and that the Spirit of God dwell in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? There's a little problem with the English language. In the English language, whenever you come across the word you, you don't know whether the you points to her as you or to you. You don't know that. But if you go read the original Greek New Testament, because Spanish is a fully developed language, it has cases, okay? German has cases, Ale, French has cases, and what else? Greek has cases. So once you see the word in any of these languages, you know whether it is singular or plural, not In this case, in this verse, it is you together. The whole church in this verse is the temple. God dwells among his people in this congregation. In the newly revised New International Version, let me read it to you. They revised it. The first one was in 1978, and this is the latest version of the New International Version. It says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy the person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are a temple. I like us to move to First Corinthians six nineteen. For you to know the context, <clears throat> I'll read verse, beginning with verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin a man does, it's outside of the body, but he who commits sexual immor immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So in this particular verse, the body refers to the physical body of each person. So let's remember whether singular or collective. We Christians are the temple of God. Let us remember that, because in our daily living, there would be a lot of times when we will kind of forget that we are representing a God who is holy, and therefore we too are holy and sacred. When I was a young student at the college, Local church elders would preach sermons uh, <laughs> telling us, you, there are places that you young people cannot go. You cannot enter the movie house because Jesus cannot enter and would never enter the movie house. Uh, one summer I was, I was with a group of student pastors in the Philippines, you would not be accepted as a pastor 
if you did not complete a 350 hour time of selling, let's say, cold quarter work, okay? So I was a cold quarter student, cold quarter, I was selling books, and we were assigned in the Sin City, in the Philippines where the Sin City, Olongupo City, mm -hmm. where there was this uh, U.S. Naval base. Okay. Huge. The biggest U.S. Naval base outside continental U.S. Super. And uh, our customers, most of them were Subic Bay? Pardon? Subic Bay. Subic Bay is only a small portion, but you know, it's a huge yeah, area. Yeah. And so there was this uh, like uh, Mag Sai Sai Avenue, just like Hollywood's uh, Sunset Boulevard. You know, I mean by that. Yeah. And so we would enter these uh, um, mm -hmm. nightclubs and approach the, the manager and uh, would sell books. And so one time we were lucky enough, there was this nice manager. He welcomed us and, you know, he sat us at one table, gave us some you know, soft drinks and he would call his, uh, what do they call them? Uh, we call them in the Philippines, we just call them hostesses, okay? mm -hmm. mild mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And so we would, you know, we would sell books to them. And we did sell a lot of books. And then we were so jumpy and happy that night coming out of the uh, uh, pub house, we call it pub house. Uh, we didn't realize that the elder of the church of Olongapo City saw us coming out of the that <laughs> The next Sabbath, you know, without him knowing what we did inside, he actually lambasted us during the worship service. I thought it was not fair, you know, because we were students and we were braver. We were braver to reach out to those prostitutes. And they were just sitting comfortably in their homes, not doing anything. So don't believe that there are places, you know, that Jesus cannot go. If you get inside a pub house intentionally for the purpose of eliciting whatever, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus would still follow you through the Holy Spirit and will try to grab you out of it. Don't forget, your individual bodies are individual bodies. And as a church, collectively, we are 